Hi, my name is Paul Anzalotti. I am the founder of the Amerasia Consulting Group. I will also be your presenter today. And in this session, we are going to cover the business school interview. Please bear with me today. I have a bit of a cold, so if I uh, cough, I promise not to get you sick. The agenda for today. First, a quick introduction, then a brief overview of the admissions process, and then we're going to do a deep dive into the interview. Most applicants, when they get into the process of applying to business school, initially seem a little overwhelmed. They want to know if they're a good candidate for business school. There's about 41 different characteristics here that a potential candidate would have to consider. Those who are successful in their application inevitably hit on most of these pretty well. What I've seen in my six years of admissions consulting experience is that these variables usually regress to an equation that is represented here on the slide. What you can see here that on the x-axis is that the number of years from graduation What you can see along the x-axis is the number of years post-undergraduate graduation. So the number three would represent three years after you graduated from undergrad. On the y-axis here, there's an approximation of your, your growth. And what you can see here is that your work experience, along with your personal passions, pursuits, philanthropy, plus your reasons for adding an MBA, should approximately sum up to your short-term and long-term goals, as articulated, of course, in your essays, in your application, in your resume, but of course, logically, and in the future, when you actually realize them. The one thing that I've seen applicants at top business schools often not consider is the admissions committee view. For example, the ADCOM is stuck in literally a pair of finger cuffs. They have to balance a number of variables. For example, they get heat from alumni and faculty. They have to satisfy recruiters who will eventually and hopefully hire the students that are coming out of their program. Also, they're somewhat of a slave to their rankings and what Business Week and US News and Financial Times and The Economist and any number of other publications seem to think about their school, which, for some reason, can change quite drastically from year to year or every two years, for that matter. The one thing that the admissions committee really has to focus on <laughs> with regards to how they make their decisions is getting the best students versus the optimal mix of students. The optimal mix of students would be people with uh, 790 GMAT scores, 3.9 GPAs, and uh, have all their teeth when they smile. The best students are actually the students that would attend the school if accepted. You often see this reflected in yield. So, for example, Harvard has a yield that approaches uh, in the low 90s. And you would see that a school like Chicago would probably have a yield that would be, well, a number of degrees below that. But Really, the overarching message here, when you do talk to an admissions committee, is that you definitely want to show fit with their program. So you can see here this rudimentary Venn diagram. Now, moving the overlap, moving both of these circles together, increasing the overlap, they really want to know not only who you are across all aspects of the application, including the interview, but they also really want to know why you want to go to their illustrious program, which is something you can articulate face to face when you get the interview, of course. Now, really quick overview on how decisions are actually made. Paying a lot of attention to the most right bucket here, the one-third bucket on the right that's titled presentation. You can see here that there are the hardcore numbers, you know, GMAT, GPA. And then the second bucket here is personal qualities that you pretty much can articulate through the essays, maybe resume, 
and of course in the interview, but really the one-third bucket is how well you communicate your presentation, how polished you are. And that is definitely done, of course, on the essays, but really your chance to hammer it home and your chance to really cross the T's and dot the I's comes in the interview. Of course, you have to get that interview. And if you see here, not only do you have to articulate why MBA and why the school, as I mentioned a few slides ago, but you really, really have to hammer home um, your clarity of purpose. And we're going to cover that later when we talk about how to answer the interview questions. Again, it all comes down to numbers with certain aspects for the admissions committee. But if you look here on the right-hand side, with respect to a 1 through 6 rating at this example school, you'll see that all of the characteristics that you need to express can all be done, of course, across varying aspects of the application, essays, resume, what have you. But note here that in every instance, if you can get the interview, once you're in front of the admissions committee person or the second year student or the alumni, you have a chance to hammer home all of these things again and make your case as to why you shouldn't be rejected, waitlisted, and of course, accepted. The other thing to recognize too, just to give you a little background before we deep dive into the whole interview, is that we have an applicant here, a Rajiv applicant. Your application will be read most likely by two people. They'll vote according to the system I articulated over the last few slides. And if you can both get them to vote, you, to stay on the island, you'll definitely get the interview. Now, if both of them have, like for example, if Reader 1 has a 1 through 3 score, which is good, and Reader 2 has a 4 through 6 score, which is really not that good, it'll go to a third reader. And that third reader, he or she, will be judge, jury, and execution nor deciding whether or not you get the interview. Now, if you can get the interview, I always use this analogy, so forgive me if you've heard it before, uh, but basically, if you can get the interview, it's akin to the control tower at your local airport telling you, hey, you as the pilot, as the applicant, we're giving you the green light to land. And all you have to do, for the most part, is coast on in, smile, form complete sentences, don't have food on your shirt, land your airplane without crashing and burning. I love that example. But anyway, example two, for those of you who need something a little more, uh, let's say, uh, touchy-feely, it's where it's in the interview where you can tell them, hey, not only you know, do I love this school, but I'm in love with this school. And you're trying to force, again, these two intersecting circles together to get them to believe that not only do you love them, but that you're in love with them. You know, it's a difference between I like you and I'm in like with you, I suppose. But anyway, two examples to show you. If you can get the interview, just land it, don't crash and burn. Again, interviews, summary view. They want to put a face with a name. They want to they want to see if you're actually likable. If you're the type of guy that they would want to sit down with, or gal, want to sit down and have a glass of beer or wine with. And of course, during the interview. And this most often happens with uh, admissions committee members or even second year students. They're trying to put on their little recruiter hat uh, and, and look across the table and think, okay, if I were a recruiter, would I hire you? Would I want you to be a part of my team? If you notice, there are several schools that, that do ask you for your picture. Um, you know, Columbia's a good example of that. They straight up ask you for your mug. But there's other schools who ask you pretty much for PowerPoint presentations and, and, and other things of this sort. They're trying to get a good idea of what you look like um, to a certain extent. So uh, with that in mind, make sure when you are doing some of these PowerPoint presentations, and not to get too far off track here, that uh, your pretty face is definitely front and center. Okay, so I was a, well, I'm a UCLA Anderson graduate, full-time MBA program. I was an admissions interview there as well. And what I can tell you is that using UCLA and HPS as two uh, typical um, polar opposite examples um, in certain instances, uh, that there are a number of factors here on the left-hand side that you need to be aware of. Some schools are a little more touchy-feely, some schools are a little more, I won't say cold prickly, but they will definitely drill down into what it is that you're saying and examine. I know Ms. D. Leopold, 
uh, does have a reputation for asking a lot of follow-up questions. And that's her style, and that's good. It's nothing to be intimidated by. She just wants to make sure that um, you can articulate your point of view very well, and also that, um, well, you're not full of crap. So um, if you go through this list here, you can see that, you know, I, exa I exaggerate a little when I say, uh, you know, interrogation or whatever. But um, you need to have an understanding of there are interviews. But then if you start to bifurcate or cut up or chop up interviews into different aspects, you can see they're here on the left-hand side. Now, I did draw these. So uh, hold the applause for till, until the, uh, the end of the session. But the one thing you want to do is nobody's perfect. Well, almost nobody's perfect. But in the interview, you want to definitely address your potential weaknesses. So we have our stick figure here on the left-hand side with the question marks above his or her head. Um, but basically, in general, there are a number of factors that you're going to have to address as any candidate. But let's say you're a slightly older candidate. Um, it's early 30s, maybe, for a full-time program. And you happen to be, a, well, captain of the Titanic, or former captain of the Titanic, rather. And you're going to be in there, and the first thing they're going to think is, why somebody at the age of, uh, let's say, 34, why would you be applying to business school? And they see maybe you're a lawyer, they see you've done a lot of different types of jobs, and they're going to think, geez, is this middle-aged man before us uh, looking for an escape hatch? Are they looking for us to throw them a life raft? Are they in a dead-end career? And just by, by virtue of being a little bit older, you need to address that. And of course, it can be done in other components, essays, even resume. But it definitely has to be driven home in the interview. And if you're unemployed and you happen to be older, you really are behind the gun to explain why. Uh, you need an MBA and what's been going on and is your career advancing and, well, why you need an MBA now. That is the, crit that is the most critical question that you can answer as an older applicant. Um, and to show that you aren't in a dead-end situation. And also, at your ripe old age of 34, do you really have realistic goals? I mean, how much gas do you have left in the tank for this career until you hit uh, mandatory retirement age, let's say? So if you're advocating that uh, in the long term you want to go out and change the world, turn water into wine, and then, and then walk on it perhaps, you're going to have to make the case that you are realistic given the, um, the maturity, the number of gray hairs on your head, let's say. Um, because let's face it, there is only a certain duration that you will have versus somebody who is 25. Now, the young man and or woman on the right-hand side with the graduation cap and the, well, I guess that's a diploma um, in his or her hand, this person, well, they're under the gun very much to also demonstrate or dictate why MBA now, but it's for much different reasons. And really what the admissions committee wants to see from, let's say, a 21, 22-year-old that, of course, you've pretty much kicked butt at everything you've done throughout your whole life, um, and, uh, you know, obviously up to the point of, of graduation. And, you know, if, if you're part of, for example, if you're part of a, a club at uh, your undergraduate, the Glee Club, you pretty much have to be president of the Glee Club or co-president of the Glee Club. Um, and you would have had to graduate at the top of your class, and you really should get a GMAT score that is pretty darn close to the 99th percentile. And the other thing, too, is that you really, really have to hammer home the nature of your contributions in the varying environments that you've been a part of, whether it's an exchange program or clubs or in the classroom or as a teaching assistant. Anywhere that you've gone, you have to show that you have been a contributor because they're going to think, okay, this young man and or woman hasn't had a lot of job experience. They can't really bring that to the table, so that may limit their contributions. So we're going to be looking to see that anything that they've done, they've really, really had a profound impact on, especially for a 21-year-old. And the other thing, too, uh, and this is something that I've observed working with a number of younger candidates, you have to demonstrate maturity. So none of the, um, the leadership or management approaches of, uh, you know, the, the beatings will continue until morale approves type thing. I've seen a lot of that. Yeah, okay, a successful 21-year-old recent graduate will probably know better. But just be aware that they're looking 
for perverse styles of management because arguably you haven't made a lot of mistakes and maybe you've been able to ram through a lot of change or or um or you know initiatives at your club or organization or wherever you've been as an undergrad but just make sure that you're not sounding like you just stepped out of a Justin Bieber or Britney Spears concert that you were well you're wise beyond your years okay I think you get the point moving along <clears throat> the other thing you have to do too in the interview is you really have to drive home your differentiation versus competition now there's a lot of nice people out there in the world and not all of them are really cut out for an MBA program but within your silo here and uh, I did this on AutoCAD but within your silo here whatever one you may fall into you have to understand that certain schools will have certain bandwidth for certain backgrounds so let's use Columbia Business School as an example they will definitely have <clears throat> a big silo for the finance peeps you can see here I don't know if anybody here is familiar with engineering drawings, but little circles here at the bottom of each line indicate that they are louvers and they are able to move. So anyway, you just have to make sure that you are differentiating yourself versus the competition. And of course, if you're a finance person, um, you know, you're not necessarily comparing yourself against a marketing person or even a consultant or, of course, the, the IT guys. You're really comparing yourself against the finance people. So don't worry about demonstrating why you are incrementally better or more competitive than somebody who was a professional underwater basket weaver. That's not who you're competing against. You're not competing against a non-traditional. But in the same way, if you are preparing to apply to a school, or even if you have the interview, just recognize that if you are interviewing at a school like Columbia, which is finance-oriented, uh, so I've heard, uh, that you are basically showing them as a professional underwater basket weaver that you do have you do bring to the table a great deal of analytical uh, skills and that you won't be overwhelmed by the quantitative nature of the core, for example, or have your finance colleagues run circles around you in certain classes like accounting, finance, or econ. So anyway, bottom line, you're in the interview, reinforce certain characteristics uh, before your interviewer basically forms an opinion of them because you haven't brought up anything about how great you are at spreadsheeting or modeling or what have you for an underwater basket weaver. Now, <clears throat> at a high level, the morning after the interview, there you're going to be judged, of course. And when I say the morning after, it's basically whenever they receive the evaluation report that, let's say, the alumni interviewer punches into the computer system, and they actually get around to reading it. So morning after, it may be about 14 or 21 morning afters, um, which could seem like all the time in the world because it is a time of anxiety. But anyway, uh, basically the top 1% to top percentage, clear admits, to borrow a, 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 an industry term, walk on water, let's open up the pearly gates for this candidate. And then there are the other top 15 and top 40. Top 15, they're going to admit most likely. And again, it depends what silo you fall into. There are a lot of, let's say, uh, IT applicants applying from the South Asia region. Um, just know it's extremely competitive. So maybe you're going to have to be in the top 5% of all interviewed candidates to be able to make it in. Um, but this is where it gets a little crazy slash hairy slash uh, waitlisty. Top 40, top 15%, right in that range. That's where you start getting waitlisted. So it's like, you're good. We like you. We may just have too many of you, whatever that demographic may be, so we're going to place you on the wait list. Or we may not think that you're actually serious about coming here. Maybe you're overqualified for the job, so to speak. And they're going to wait list you to see how bad you want it. Are you actually going to show up to the school? Are you going to write letters? Whatever. Uh, are you going to convince them that you love that school and them? Now, people who fall kind of in the, you know, the 60 percenters, um, that was kind of in the interstitial state, as I'll say, you're pretty much denied. And, and there's really not much you can, you can do. I mean, this is where if you're a son or daughter of privilege, you may be able to have your mom or dad pull some strings. Um, and, and what I mean by pull some strings is the reality of what happens after the interview, if it doesn't go well, 
is that, uh, well, if your family happens to be donating a lot of money to the school, that's where this, that's where this really, really can help. Um, now, let's say you're in the bottom 40%. Uh, you're on the other side of the track, so to speak. Clear deny. You, I mean, you're going to have to call the prez um, to help you out because it's, you know, they, there's, you can only do so much with influence and pretty much you, uh, you have it all you got and, and that was it. So, now the Interviews have to back the stories that you're telling in your essays. I cannot tell you the number of times that I saw as a UCLA Anderson interviewer when looking at somebody's resume and asking them questions about their background and hearing them tell a number of stories, how things, uh, well, quite often did not line up. So I remember there may have been one time where I was interviewing an engineering candidate and I have an engineering background and it really didn't make sense that an engineer would have a certain level of responsibility or a certain, certain scope of responsibilities that they claimed that they were having. And then when pressed further, you could hear crickets chirping and uh, perhaps an awkward silence. But um, you just have to make sure that you have your story straight and that, <clears throat> of course, you are mitigating weaknesses and you have to make sure that you have a good blend of stories during the interview. I always advocate 3-2, the 3-2 defense slash offense. But what that really means is that you have three professional stories, because after all, this is a professional interview, and you have two personal stories, because you want them to like you. And a lot of people try to memorize stories or questions and answers, it's like stimulus response, stimulus response. You don't really want to do that. You just want to have three good professional stories, leadership stories that you can morph into answering any questions. Because what really is the difference between tell me about a time you worked on a team versus what's your most significant leadership accomplishment? If you distill it down into its bare elements or what they're really asking you to do, it's really the same thing. So make sure you have three professional, at least three professional, at least two personal, and that you're able to modify them on the fly to answer questions. And I always advocate going in order of the strongest stories. But anyway, now again, not to beat a dead horse, but you really have to have a clear message. And that's what we're going to dedicate basically the rest of these slides to, along with answering some example type questions. But you really have to be clear. And, and trust me, the last thing your interviewer wants to sit through after sitting through four other unclear interviewees and interviews of that day is to see here yet another person who really may have a good candidacy on paper, has a good resume, but stutters. I mean, and I'm not talking about, uh, about uh, the actual verbal answer. I'm talking about mentally, just cannot get it out in a clear fashion. So not only do you want to answer with common themes 
and you want to have those teams kind of cover each other's butts. The Olympic rings here are really butts being covered. So stories have to back stories. So you wouldn't say, listen, I uh, you know, needed to get the trains to run on time, so you know, started beating people with wet noodles. That is not a good management style. And then you certainly, what makes that even worse is when you describe another type of story that says a touchy-feely, um, you know, fuzzy pet rescue.org story where everybody's saying kumbaya. So remember, stories have to cover each, other but, each other's butts here, but also you have to demonstrate a continuity of, of management style, goals, beliefs, ethics. All right, now diving deeper into how do you answer a question correctly? How do you answer it effectively and efficiently without wasting the interviewer's time or making them roll their eyes? Without, roll, without actually rolling their eyes at you, is to use something called the pyramid principle. Now, this is uh, not my idea. This is um, actually developed by a lady named Barbara Minto of uh, McKinsey. And she sold, uh, I would imagine, quite a few of these books. You can pick one up on Amazon. I think, uh, I don't know if they're currently in print, but uh, last time I looked, I think it was 80 or $90 for, for a used version. So <clears throat> start saving. But basically, what, this is what the pyramid principle is. Think of a pyramid, and this roughly does look like a pyramid. But you want to state your answer first. What's your favorite color? My favorite color is blue. Why? Because blue is serene. Why? Because blue is the color of the ocean. Why? Because blue is the color of the sky. Like all those, all those supporting evidence for why blue is your favorite color completely replicates what you see here on the slide. You give the answer first, and then you provide several reasons for why that is so, why blue is your favorite color. So answer the question first, and then support it with how or why. And why this is a good way to answer most questions that you're going to be asked in the interview, remember most questions, is because it allows you to immediately tell the interviewer where this is all going, and it gives quick hit justification, bam, 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 and then it allows you to stop after, let's say, two minutes of explanation, and if the interview is really interested in one of the three facets you laid out about the color blue, they'll follow up and they'll ask you, hey, uh, Serene, what is that exactly? And that's when you whip out your dictionary. No, that's when you basically drill deeper into what serenity means to you or whatever. And that is where you allow it to become more of a conversation, a dialogue, as opposed to just a, a monologue. And the worst interviewers by far that I've ever been a part of are ones where somebody just keeps going on and on and on. And in about the five-minute mark, you just kind of like, okay, moving on, at least mentally. But then in about the six-minute mark, literally, I would say, okay, uh, tell you what, uh, let's, let's come back to that. That's, that's not a good thing to hear in an interviewer or in an interview as the interviewee. Anyway, so here's, here's, a, you know, here's more of an expanded kind of pyramid principle example. I know I just gave you one about the color blue, but let's use something that's a little more business school related, your definition of leadership. So somebody would ask me, and I'll just go live here. We'll do it live. Definition of leadership, really, I would say, well, my definition of leadership is the ability, my ability, to get a number of disparate interests on the same page together, marching in the same direction to achieve a common goal. And how I've always been able to do this is by giving people a voice in the process and allowing them to feel like a valued member of the team and that they actually have an influence on the outcome. Now, see that? Let's just hit timeout real quick. I just totally told them what the answer was, didn't I? So the interviewer now, that's a great answer, by the way, but the interviewer now definitely knows where this is all going right away. He has the answer. I don't even need to explain anything else, but I will, because anybody can say that, right? Just Google definition of leadership, and I could regurgitate that as well. So let's bring the house. Let's bring the evidence. Let's bring professional evidence. Let's bring personal evidence. So I would follow that up. So now we're going to hit the time in button. So. Professionally, I've demonstrated this as my role as a senior lead engineer and as a project manager on the Ford Aerostar project. 
And on the lead engineering role, I was able to generate these results and I was able to create this type of new system of quality or manufacturing processes that uh, impacted the organization ongoing, um, you know, past my tenure in that role. And then in role two on the Windstar project, I was able to do X and Y, produce a great minivan, which ultimately led to much happier, much happier families. Um, but then, personally, I've demonstrated a very similar set of characteristics in my role with the fuzzypetrescue.org. And this definitely, by, by creating this entity or saving fuzzy pets or making them fuzzier, I've been able to demonstrate my passion for all things fuzzy. I've also been able to demonstrate my values for all things pets. And, you know, this has affected not only the fuzzy pet rescue, not only, uh, you know, the number of funds we've raised to, uh, you know, grow more uh, fuzzy pets, but it's also allowed me to, uh, you know, it basically allowed me to further my values or implant my values or, um, you know, gain a greater understanding of my values, beliefs, and norms uh, that are based on my culture and family or what have you. So you can see here that this allows you to keep adding on layers and layers and layers and drilling down ad nauseum, which is not, not what you want to do in an interview, but this structure allows you in an interview, but really on, even on your essays and in life um, when you're answering a question, to go as far as the interviewer or the person asking you the question wants to take it without boring them to death, frankly, or going off track. So I would encourage everybody, when they're looking at these representative questions that you can find all over the internet for any school uh, that you may be asked in an interview, to really, really think about <clears throat> how you could apply the pyramid principle to answering those questions. And for that matter, next time you ask somebody a question, see how directly they give you the answer and then back it up with evidence. <clears throat> now, we have to also recognize that not every interview question, just like any, just like not every uh, essay, will ask you for a succinct to the point definition. <clears throat> In fact, some interview questions require a story. So in the prior slide, I gave you the definition of leadership, my definition of leadership. However, it won't always be that cut and dry or that easy. You could also be asked for a story. <clears throat> and that would look something like, tell me about a time you demonstrated leadership. Or tell me about a time you, you know, you, you achieved something significant. That's when they're asking for a story. So again, Define your, your, you know, define your view of leadership. That's like a very pyramid type answer. But tell me about a time when, or tell me a story when, or give me an example when. That's starting to venture very much into story territory. And so this is how you would modify the pyramid principle to address that. <clears throat> you would basically stick, uh, you know, almost like a preface onto the, the pyramid principle <clears throat> that we defined in the prior slide. So you would talk about a situation that you were in. You know, in January of 2010, I was on a team of uh, five engineers, and we were tasked with coming up with X, Y, Z. So that's the situation. And what makes it complicated, for example, is that, um, you know, I was the most senior guy, and maybe I only had two years of work experience. Or maybe everybody got some type of flu and cashed out, or maybe GM came along and hired all of my engineers at Ford. Anyway, the, you're just setting the stage with a situation, and then you're upping the ante with the complication, and then you're going to get to the part <clears throat> of your actual answer, which is not, and again, you wouldn't, you have to think here. You don't just say, and now my definition of leadership is yada, yada. No, you say, you have to be a little more subtle. Uh, you say here, in answering the actual question, you describe your leadership actions as opposed to giving a definition like with a straight-up pyramid principle, which was the slide before. Here you pretty much start describing your actions, and you would go in action one. So what I did was I had to go advocate on behalf of my team or the remaining engineers to the senior management, and I had to come up with a, a contingency plan. I had to do this and that. And then also, though, I had to go talk with my team. So I had to manage up, but now I have to manage down. And I had to go to my team, and I said, listen, guys and gals, we need all hands on deck. I need you here. You know, can we all fist bump? Um, and then you served as cheerleader, coach, 
mentor, confidant, best friend, uh, and sometimes manager. So basically <clears throat> what's going on here is that and, and you see this a lot, or I see this a lot, rather, in, in leadership-type stories, is that I'm managing up, I'm managing down. The whole point here is that you're describing your actions. And now, beyond the bottom of the slide, that's when you would start getting into results. So, you know, what were the <clears throat> results of, of action one? You know, where you went and advocated on behalf of your team to upper management or the senior leadership team. What, you know, how did you, obviously you can't order them around, even though it'd be nice. You obviously have to rely on your powers of persuasion um, and or persuasion. Well, how did that work out? You know, how did you convince them? And obviously, you'd be in a situation probably where you'd have to show and not necessarily tell. But then on the other hand, with your team, you could totally dictate with them. You could totally drop the hammer, um, you know, eliminate bathroom breaks type thing. And, of course, that would be com the completely wrong thing to do. But you have to show, like, even when you were in a position to, let's say, drop the hammer or tell everybody that, uh, you know, to put their, to put their uh, nose down and just keep working and don't ever look up, uh, you didn't do that. Instead, you gave everybody a voice, and eventually you guys learned how to sing Kumbaya and dance around the campfire. Now, you see that more laid out here. And I'm not going to actually go through it again, but you can definitely see here, and I call it SCAR, Situation, Complication, Action, Results, and even Applicability as the last day. <clears throat> you can see here that it follows roughly what I said on the prior slide. Now, what I want to concentrate on here is applicability, also known as applicability. And this is something that you don't always have to do, but in the interview, you don't always have to do it in the, in the essays, because essays have word counts, and arguably interviews have minutes, but when you can, without sounding like a used car salesman with a plaid jacket on and high waters, without sounding like that, see if you can, in your head when you're practicing, or even on game day during the interview, if you can circle it back to the school in question without sounding like a cheese ball and talk about, okay, so, you know, this is my, you know, this is my leadership actions, this is what I got out of it, this is the lessons I learned, here's how my definition may have changed. Well, this reminds me of your school, because at your school you have a leadership development program. It's very much why I'm interested in the program. And I really, really feel like the lessons that I learned back in the day working will definitely contribute to whatever leadership development program that I'm a part of. Um, just like I know that uh, other people will bring their own set of leadership lessons to build out my automotive engineering experience at Ford Motor Company. All right. I think you get the point. So, for those who did not, here's a summary slide. Scar versus pyramid. Scar is a story. You're committing yourself to like a four to five minute story, let's say. And the interviewer doesn't really have a lot of time to interject unless you're completely unclear. And it's going to be a story. It's going to be something that is much longer than the pyramid. Straight up pyramid principle. I mean, they're variations of each other. But straight up pyramid principle to the point, you know, what's your favorite color? What's a good place to retire? What are your goals? So that is definitely to the point, quick hit answer. Don't launch into a story. The important thing that you want to do is when you're looking at all this stuff again, is look at the questions, recognize which one is straight up pyramid, which one is SCAR, which one requires a story. And I'll tell you right now, and we'll get into this a little later, the only kind of hybrid maybe, or the only one that a lot of people have a lot of questions on or can't immediately discern would be the, you guessed it, walk me through your resume. But we'll get to that. All right. A couple of frameworks, FWs. Now, when you're answering question, game day, always think about, <clears throat> you know, always think about how you can drive. You want to slide in the home. You want to score the run, for those of you not familiar with baseball and or cricket. Um, you want to score run. So always, always in the interview, try to drive home your passion for the program, that, you, that this is the only school you want to go to. This is the only school you've ever wanted to go to. Okay, of course you'll be applying to other programs, but you really have to make them feel like they're special. They're the only girl for you or guy for you. So having been an Anderson interviewer, having seen other evaluations that interviewers need to do, 
for candidates after the interview. I know that the vast majority of the questions are like, do you feel like the candidate understood the school, understood how they fit the school, had a passion for the program, understood all these unique differentiators, courses, clubs, organizations, programs, pragmatic field studies. And I have seen this question that they ask your interviewer to evaluate is, if accepted, do you really feel like this person would go to our illustrious, awesome school? <clears throat> and you really want them, I mean, it's a pretty binary question, but usually they'll have a one through five. You really want them to mark a five. That is, in fact, the highest rating. Another framework, and I kind of hit on this in some of the, uh, the SCARA or pyramid slides from uh, two minutes ago. When you talk about results, you got to talk about paying it forward. <clears throat> There's always quantitative results. This is very important, even for your essays, but also for your, especially in your interviewer. You don't want to, you don't want to be this, this person who is always like, and then we made a million dollars, you know, sign on the line that is dotted, and then I went to Aruba. You don't want to sound like it's all for, you know, it's either a zero or one binary win. You want to sound like, yes, of course there were financial results. Of course I did all the stuff that I was supposed to do and a little bit more. But I don't really want credit for that because anybody can make money. What you're trying to say is that you left. The best stories and the best interview examples and the best way to drive a point home is, yeah, we did all that, got the t-shirt, but the, the imprint or the lasting uh, or the legacy that, we, that I left was able to leave through this change, changed the culture of our group, our team, opened up more opportunities for, for young people such as myself to step up and lead. Um, those are the types of results that they really want to hear. But, and you want to leave them smiling. And I'm always a big fan of state the, the quantitative first, we made a million bucks, then state the qualitative touchy-feely kumbaya results right afterwards. Because that's how you want them to remember, remember you. They don't really care. Business schools really don't care about how much money you make or how much money you saved or how many widgets your team pumped out in an hour. They care about the touchy feeling. It's like, based on those results, do we believe that that Rajiv applicant here is a person who, well, you know, really does believe that the touchy feely nature is is paramount, really did achieve a touchy feely result, and if admitted to our school, will do great things. And if they graduate from our school, will they go on to change the world in the long term? Now, the one thing that sometimes drives me a little crazy <clears throat> is a few things. I, you always have to know thy program. You have to know the schools that you're applying to. And I'm really, really not joking about this. This is a seriously underrated aspect, and it always comes to a head at the interview when you, but also your interviewer, realize you don't know jack about the school. Now, the, the, the cynical out there um, among the masses They'll say, well, aren't, aren't all these schools all the same? Like, look at all these one through five. What school really couldn't, couldn't say that? I mean, or one through six, rather. What school couldn't say that? Well, Anderson, actually, I know does say this, but pretty much this could apply to all schools that are out there. But that's not the point. The point is, is that you have to know the names, the courses, the clubs. You have to show up to the interview, and you have to sound like you're prepared. And you, you better know the, the, even the, the course numbers who the professor is, if they're an awesome professor, how popular the class is. And that all comes through like hitting on all these elements and, and understanding like understanding how you fit into these 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 variables comes with actually reading about school of course on the internets, but also talking to current students. Well, what if you don't know any current students? That's not really a problem. Wanna know why? Because all you have to do is let's say you're an entrepreneur, get on to the Entrepreneurship Association's website for your targeted MBA program, read about who's a part of it, what they're doing, you know, basically their new news or blog feed, and figure out who the key players are, the presidents, the vice presidents, and email any one of them that you feel like you may have a connection with because you've worked on something similar or what have you and get them to talk. If that doesn't work, go to the next person. Like literally start a phone tree. And all you have to do is 
get one or two on the phone to talk about what it's like. Get insider information. What's their big upcoming event? What's the annual party like? What's their favorite aspect of the Entrepreneurship Association? For that matter, you could also pick up the phone and call the the person who actually is the director of the the entrepreneurship center at UCLA or any other school you're applying to. That's literally all you have to do. And now, of course, you don't want to really waste your time, so you want to have something to say. And hopefully, you're an entrepreneur. Otherwise, well, maybe you won't. But you would be surprised. At least I am, as to how many people just don't do that. Just pick up the phone. Just pick up the the phone. Call. Reach out and touch someone, as AT&T, I think, used to say. So, in the interview, if you can bring up stuff like that, like, oh, yeah, I talked with, uh, you know, I talked with Joe Blow of the Entrepreneurship Association. We had a great 30-minute conversation. We discussed the other. Like, that type of, that type of, like, personal introduction to the school, you're coming across, okay, maybe in your essays, but certainly in your interview, that, that is a deal sealer. So, just just the personal approach, going that extra mile, even if you've never visited the school, and not everybody, all my international peeps out there, I, I know you can't just hop on the old 777 um, and, and, and land a few hours later. So just know that you can reach out via this thing called the internets and, um, and get it done that way. Now, the other thing, too, that, that is related to knowing thy program is that, and, and also related to the kind of the, the prior slide that I talked about is you really have to have a good understanding of of um, how you fit in. Now, I'll give you an example. In the essays, there'll be questions like, uh, what are your goals and how will Wharton help you achieve them, for example. Now, what does that mean? It's not just saying, hey, short term I'm going to do X and long term I'm going to do Y and like Wharton's totally awesome and they have all these classes and stuff. Like it's not that. It's saying, listen, man, these are my goals, and this is what I've done so far to work towards these goals. But I have a, a gap that can be addressed by an MBA, general management knowledge, for example, core curriculum, for example. But I have these specific gaps like I have no idea what finance is or accounting is or HR or anything out of my automotive engineering industry. And specifically at Wharton, there is, um, and I'm making this up, but there is a Center for Automotive Business Studies and other cool things. And I want to take part in that center. I mean, if you look at Wharton's essays, for example, essay, um, it's, it's the one that asks about a co-curricular activity. They're literally saying, you better show up here and know exactly why it is you want to go to the school. Be very specific. And we're going to ask you to write up five, six, seven hundred words about this. That's how specific and how detailed you need to drill in. So you have to have a good understanding of your strengths and weaknesses, you know, what you can bring to the school, and, and also what you can take away from the school as well. Um, and that is something that needs to completely come out in an interview. And don't be so preoccupied with getting across. By the way, you can go over, but don't, don't be so preoccupied about getting your five or ten or 500 points across that you wrote down and were studying on your cheat sheet two minutes before you walked in the interview. Don't have an agenda. Just let it flow and let it let it come naturally. Let it be a conversation. Don't you know? Don't don't check the boxes. It, it'll be readily apparent that you're completely scripted. And that's not necessarily bad if you're a really really bad interviewer. But you know, the more sophisticated among us, we'll make it a conversation. Let it let it let it flow. Especially if you come from let's say an engineering background or a back accounting background where you know the stereotypes you're a little you're a little rigid um you know you sit up straight well just know the more personable you are the more you seem like a normal person the more you break that type of stereotype anyway i think you get it moving on now before you walk through that door before you actually meet with your interviewer there are several resources that I think you may have heard of, like LinkedIn and Facebook, to find out background information. I just wanted to point this out in the interest of thoroughness, but quite often I meet people who have not heard about people.com. Well, let me tell you about people.com. It is the world's greatest. This is a life tip. This isn't just an, an interview tip. People.com is perhaps the world's greatest stalker engine. Um, it will definitely find LinkedIn profiles and Facebook profiles. Go there, type in first name, last name, and city, if you have it, 
and uh, it'll pretty much dig up everything. And I would also encourage you, those who are applying to top business schools, uh, why don't you punch your name in there and hit search and see what comes up? Because if something slightly off, let's say, comes up, uh, trust me, the admissions committee people do have Facebook and other type things, and they will be looking for you. So get rid of all of the, I, w I don't even know, MySpace type stuff, um, the Dungeons and Dragons forums, and you know, and, and the anarchist, uh, and the anarchist, uh, you know, blogs, and just, just do the best you can to basically wipe all that stuff off. But anyway, people.com, great to learn more about your interviewer. And another interview pro tip here is that definitely read up and see what your interviewer likes. Usually this works well with alumni and what they're into, um, you know, within reason. And, uh, you know, for example, if they, if they like, uh, what are playing chess? Well, and, and you like playing chess or you recently acquired a passion for chess, you can definitely, if the opportunity presents itself, to start talking about, oh, yeah, you know, put it on your resume. I was a four-time captain of the chess team at, um, you know, University of Nardo or whatever. So that is what, you know, that is what can, can draw them in. And, and also bring copies of your resume, update a resume to the, to the interview. But that's, you know, that's definitely something that, um, that can help make the interview more personal, personal, more conversational, and win the hearts and minds of your interviewer. Uh, but uh, then again, uh, don't go too far. Don't ever tell your interviewer that you Googled them or you peopled them or you poked them or whatever. Uh, just play it cool and don't force anything because if all of a sudden out of the blue you're like, I love chess too, it's going to look pretty weird. And then, <laughs> well, they're thinking, geez, how did, how did this guy know that? <sighs> Scary. The other thing too, just to make you aware, for those who may be just getting into the business school application process, the interview questions are all out there, every single every single one for that matter. I mean, a couple of schools have adopted new formats, so that's kind of yet to be seen. But really on GMAT Club, you find the questions, and and I think Clear Admit, to, to be perfectly honest with you, even though they are a competitor, I think they do a very good job with their interview wiki. So, um, so get on there, and you'll see all the questions. You'll figure it out. Now. Here's a good part. Questions for you. <laughs> Questions you can be expected to hear, or you will, you can you can answer sufficiently in order to get into a school are the following. And as I mentioned earlier, walk me through your resume. This is a question that tells you a few things. If you see that a school asks you, walk me through your resume. I mean, is that even a question? That's like a demand, really. This is what that means. It means it's a blind interview, that they don't know really anything about you. And that can be good or bad. Um, I think it's generally better to, to have blind interviews. But walk me through your resume is, is something where you're not, you're not literally reading a bedtime story. I mean, obviously, you brought three, three copies of your resume to the interview, not two, three. Uh, and you handed them out, and to be honest, I wouldn't even look at the resume when you're explaining this, because it looks kind of weird that you don't know your own resume, but just sit down and, and start with undergrad. Go in chron chronological order. Why did you go to University of Nardo, for example? Why did you study engineering? Why did you join this club? Why did you take your first job at Ford Motor Company, um, or whatever? company you work for now, why did you quit that job and then go on to Goldman Sachs? Why did you quit Goldman Sachs? So you get the point. You're explaining why. And why, for, you know, just to, just to break it down for you out there um, and, and take notes. So for example, I would say, and this is based off of my, my life history, I decided to go to a small school in Flint, Michigan called General Motors Institute. And the reason I decided to go there was because they had a great co-op program, as well as high rankings in the number of the, the, the uh, US news uh, polls. And when I got there, it was a really eye-opening experience. I 
was able to join student government and, and join the Society of Automotive Engineers and, and all these great clubs. But really, I began to grow up quite quickly because my first job was on a line wearing a pair of coveralls with my name sewn on to, I believe it was the left side of my chest. And I ran a, a CNC mill where we were taking Chevy 454 blocks and boring them out to 502 cubic inches. A lot of cast iron dust in the air. And then I would go, and then you know I moved on from that when I realized that I wanted to gain more of the engineering skills as opposed to the manufacturing skills. And I went on to work at BASF. I went on to work at Ford Motor Company. I went on to work at at uh, TRW. And then upon graduation, I was offered a full time position with TRW. And it was really um, at, at that moment when I had a crew underneath me that I began to realize this this type of leadership or I began to understand um, you know, the struggles that I would say the American automotive industry faced. But in reality, the struggles of the people on my team faced. Uh, and, and that was a product of environment and education and a number of different factors. But it really did cause me to grow up and mature and to understand that um, it, uh, it, it's, it, well, for lack of a better term, it sucks. You wouldn't say this in an interview, but it sucks that people are often a victim of circumstances beyond their control. And that is what, you know, and that, and when I made the switch from TRW to whatever, General Motors, I took that with me. And I believe that General Motors represented an opportunity to work for a company that was in dire straits. And through my management position, I could help be a part of their turnaround. And I did this, this, and this, and I worked on this significant project. And then I, when I started to think about what was next for my career, how I could to take on, after successfully taking on these, these initiatives at General Motors, how I could see what else is out there. What, what's bigger you know, and better that I can help achieve using my management skills, my leadership skills, and my, my, my beliefs. And ultimately, you know, um, I do want to stay whatever in this industry. But really, I began to realize that um, my next step needed to be an MBA. And that's all you need to say and walk me through your resume. You don't need to really go into your goals other than maybe just a cursory high-level glance. You don't really need to go into even why now, you know, beyond what I said, um, or even the school in question. Because all those questions will, will come. But you just kind of get up to the point of that, and it's like, bam, stop. And that way, you know, that way it flows seamlessly into the next questions, which are pretty much, you know, why an MBA? What are your goals? Why this school? And so, you know, why MBA? You know, set it, set it up with the walk me through your resume. And again, I was always explaining why I did something, not necessarily going line by line through my, my resume. Um, and by the way, it's totally appropriate when you're walking somebody through the resume to talk about personal things as well. And I'm not saying, oh, you know, I'm not sure if my mommy loved me enough. What I mean by personal things is all that crap at the bottom of people's resumes that nobody, that you think nobody pays attention to, badminton club you know, um, whatever else, Glee Club, all that stuff. If you're volunteering for the fuzzypetrescue.org, like list it on there, and maybe the interviewer is a pet lover, but don't be, regardless, never be afraid to say, and now, um, now that I'm thinking about what's next, and I think about not only my GM leadership experiences, but also my, my leadership experiences as the founder of the fuzzypetrescue.org, uh, I... Yeah, I, you know, and, and so you can talk about that. But also my experiences with Streetwise, but also my experiences with the, you know, XYZ nonprofit organization. And then you say, and that has allowed me to come to the conclusion that I do really need an, an MBA. And so anyway, period. Now, moving on to the next questions. These next three questions are often asked in a pack. They roam together. They roam the halls of the interview together. Why MBA? What are your goals? Why the school? Because it's really hard to have a conversation about why an MBA without talking about your goals, or for that matter, even talking or talking about the school. Because if really it's why an MBA, well, it's why an MBA at your school. But really, if we are, if we can cut up these questions, why an MBA? The honest to God, I mean, and if you notice, why an MBA? What are your goals? Why the school? These are all very pyramid type questions, straight up pyramid. Just answer the freaking question. You don't have to go see the walk me through your resume was like a story, but here. With these, these uh, why an MBA, why, you know, what are your goals, why the school? This is basically like a pyramid in quick succession. So why an MBA? Well, I've 
reached a point uh, in my life where I believe that an MBA is the most logical path to achieving my short and long-term goals. You know, and, and then and then they're gonna the, the interviewer is gonna think, wow, I, I have the freaking answer right here on a silver platter. And you can of course go into, you know, circumstances that have led to that. So you can say, as I mentioned in the walk me through your resume answer, I did work on this one project and I got this out of it. Bam. But also um, you know, in working on this other project or seeing the state of the automotive industry or what have you, I also realize there are things that I may not know today, uh, but that um I need to be prepared for account to account for going forward. So it, there's, you know, you can see pyramid. There's a peak of the pyramid. You give the base of the pyramid one, and you give another piece of evidence, base of the pyramid two, and you answer the question. So that leads basically into your goals. And if they, let's just say they asked you straight up, what are your goals? You would say, well, my goal in, my goal, and you would give kind of a high level. My goal ultimately is to, change the state of the automotive industry. Now, how I do that in the short term, so that's the peak of the pyramid, very high. Alternatively, you could say, in the short term, my goal is X, and in the long term, my goal is Y, which will ultimately change the automotive industry. Now, let me explain to you X. X, immediately upon graduation, day one, I'm going to hit the ground running doing this, and this is definitely a job that I can get. In fact, the way you describe your short-term goal in essays, but especially in the interview, you want it to almost seem like you could get that job without even having an MBA. Of course, you need the MBA but you have so much experience in this area that it's like a recruiter would have to be uh, you know, blind, dumb, and deaf to not hire you. And then you would go on to say, okay, so you just explained X short-term goal, but Y long-term goal. It's where you wax a little aspirational, philosophical, make sure it dry, jives with your values, norms, and beliefs. And ultimately, I want to I wanna, you know, make sure that the American working class, the, the American worker in heavy industry, like the automotive industry, has a future. Their kids have a future. Their pensions are secure. Uh, you know, that, that skilled labor, uh, whether it's automotive or whether it's, it's steel or whether it's manufacturing which it has a future, uh, you know, in, in America. And I plan on doing that in the long term by starting this type of consulting firm, which advises these types, you know, these types of organ manufacturing organizations on R&D tax credits that will help them keep American jobs in America. And so now that's not going to work for everybody, you know, this, this, this wrap yourself in the red, white, and blue flag, but it would have worked for my background because I came out of that industry and I had that point of view. So when you're, when you're talking about long-term goals, it is okay to be, you know, to wax um, aspirational, but it has to be true to school, meaning it has to be, you know, something that the school can arguably help you achieve. It has to be believable. It most certainly has to be based on your background. The end. Now, this leads us into straight up why this school. And again, like I mentioned before, it is, it is imperative in the interview that you make them feel like you are in love with them. They're the only guy or girl for you. And why this school? Well, there's obviously all these professional reasons, skills development, uh, networking, uh, you know, and you cite a club here and you cite another club there. But, and then, so that's kind of like, you know, in, in, in the interest of a pyramid, you would say, I want to go to your illustrious school because it will allow me to achieve my goals professionally. But also, it complements a lot of the personal characteristics and beliefs that I hold oh so dear. And so that's the peak of the pyramid. Bam. Nailed the answer. Now go into, hey, on a professional, you know, on a professional level, I'm going to gain this knowledge, these, this network, these clubs, whatever. But then when you go into the personal, you're like, the small team environment, and we'll talk about Columbia since I know it oh so well. Columbia, with your cluster system and, and with my learning team, it's just the environment that I've always performed the best in. I mean, I believe Columbia is a school that, that um, takes uh, teamwork and, and collaboration and pragmatism very seriously, and it's obviously set up that way through the the the, the cluster system. And and whether it's been at the Fuzzy Dog Pet Rescue or General Motors, I've always worked most effectively in te in, in small teams. And that my s small team, very much like the learning team, has always been the spark for bigger and better and greater things. Now you don't want to like go too far into that answer, um, 
because they may ask you another question about your greatest leadership experience and all of a sudden you're a little premature on this question by going completely um, well, going all out and you have nothing left in the gas tank later. So just say, listen, it's, it's the cluster system, uh, but most significantly the learning team, you know, like a Billy Joel song, it was a spark that lit the fire. And eventually that caused some type of great cultural change at General Motors or even in the American automotive industry. Um, so that's, you know, that's really why it's school. So you can clearly see the pyramid here, but you have to come up with your own reasons. And again, you can, that's, again, you can see in this answer, this is why doing research and understanding the school is so important. So you can't just read the web page. You got to call people. Um, you know, you, you really want first person information because that's, that separates a glossy marketing material from, you know, re real life. A real good book, by the way, folks, is you can find it. You can pretty much read the whole thing on Google Books for free. It's the Vault Guide to um, Business. Uh, it's called the Business Buzz Book by Vault. And you can read firsthand interviews of people who are current students or alumni from the school. Anyway, um, Google Books. So. Why do you, okay, so what's the next question? And here's what you see here. Why do you want an MBA now? This is a pyramid question. Just answer the freaking question and then provide supporting evidence. Why do I want an MBA now? Well, I'll give you a hint. Uh, for those of you listening, basically, and this isn't exactly framed the way you want to tell it to the interviewer, but basically you've reached a point in your career where um, you have a good understanding of your strengths and weaknesses, the gaps in your your knowledge, and what can be achieved to, uh, you know, what can what what you can achieve that will address these gaps in knowledge. Alternatively, you could say something like, um, "I need an MBA now because it's the old Peter Principle type thing. I've been promoted into a position where I'm doing very well. I learn very quickly on the job, but I can see my career trajectory, especially when I look towards my my goals." And I know that there will come a point in time where I will be promoted or asked to assume responsibility where I don't know what's going on. I will definitely won't be as effective. And having worked with all these captains of industries, all the senior leadership, I, I definitely know that, that um, I do not have this knowledge. And specifically, bam, it's in this area. And I know this because I've worked in this area or worked with this person. I can see it. It's happening. It's manifesting itself. I need to get this type of knowledge. But over here, in working in, like, say, strategic planning or whatever, um, I definitely don't understand this aspect of, of you know, of this, this aspect of strategic planning, this aspect of finance, this aspect of accounting or HR. And that's really why now is the right time, because if I do wait another year or two, and this is what you're trying to implant into the interviewer's head, if I do wait another year or two, I'm just going, not going to be effective. And would you really want to do that to me? So that's really the evidence for why now. Now. Look at these next few questions, or the next two questions. Explain a time where you worked. You don't have to read any more beyond that. Explain an ethical. You don't have to read any more beyond that. Want to know why? Because right off the bat, when you, whenever you see, like, tell me about a time, or explain a time, or yada, yada, you know that this is a story. So think SCAR, think SCARA, situation, complication, your actions, the results, qualitative, quantitative, actually quantitative and qualitative, and then without becoming, without morphing into a used car salesman, Tell me, perhaps, why it's applicable to the school that, you, that you're applying to. So, and make sure you get the school right. So, explain a time where you worked on a team and demonstrated leadership. Situation, you know, I was on, you know, and it's very basic, uh, date, time, company, location, how many people were on the team, what the task at hand was, what you were tasked with achieving. We got to get from point A to point B. Now. What makes it complicated, though? Because point A to point B, it's like things you're already supposed to do, like those aren't good stories, to be honest with you. you got to up the ante. you got to have, for lack of a better term, when feces hits the fan. That's the complication. Up the ante. You can make any situation. You know, I had to go down and buy lollipops at the uh, Five and Dime store. You can make that into the world's greatest overcoming an obstacle story if you have the right complication. You know, but they were like... Uh, wolves and uh, gladiators and um, landmines in my way. So it was made for one hell of a Sunday. But what you want to talk about is the complication 
And then you want to go into, well, then how did you navigate the, you know, literally the, the minefield? How did you do this? And this is now dictating your style of leadership, your, your actions, how you interact with people. And you want to be very specific. You want to say, first I, I thought about and I did this, then I did this. And, and, and it's not just, you're not just a one-man island or, or, you know, a one-woman island. It's, it's all about engaging other people because leadership stories are just not about you. You have to be the, you can't be the leader of me, myself, and I, right? You have to be the leader of a team. And so describe that team. Describe your interaction with the team. Describe managing up like I did on uh, slides earlier. Describe managing down um, in, in the right way. And then eventually you get to results. Remember SCAR, S-C-A-R-A. -A. Results, quantitative first, qualitative second. And then even when you're practicing before the, the big day, um, think about, okay, is this applicable to the school? Is this a story? Like, why would they ask me this type of story? Why am I answering with this type of leadership? Is there something specifically at the school that I believe what I learned or what I achieved can, can help and without sounding like it's forced? You know, don't, don't have a great story because you can end it at SCAR, S-C-A-R, and then don't, it's a great story. It's awesome. And you're like, oh, by the way, I know I just told you about my, you know, a personal story about my mom or dad, but let me tell you about why I want to join, uh, you know, this club or that club. That's when you begin to look like um, a real, a real not nice person, let's say. So other, other questions, explain an ethical dilemma that you experienced. Okay. So this could also be like um, similar questions are perhaps like explain a time you had to work with a difficult person or a difficult teammate. For example, maybe somebody was asking you to do something fairly nefarious. Um, so, so this is, again, a story. But more than concentrating on S-C-A-R-A, I want you to know this. The, the framework that I always use when I talk about an ethical dilemma, but specifically a person that's difficult to deal with, you know, maybe you could have gotten somebody fired or sold them out or whatever, sent them up the river. The one thing that you ha remember these are all management type stories leadership type stories you always kind of have to take the high ground without being completely unrealistic in, in an ethical dilemma or in dealing with a difficult person but always recognize this and I'll, and I'll go with the difficult person type example that the worst bosses or the laziest bosses in life are the bosses who pretty much just phone it in oh yeah this guy oh yeah Bruce Gary yeah from from accounting yeah, real jerk, fire him. That's a bad management style. It makes for a bad story. The framework to use, and this is something I came up with, I'm pretty proud of, but the framework to use is, is, is this. You say, listen, everybody thought this guy had an attitude problem, but I, I knew better. Maybe I'd worked with him before. Maybe I'd seen situations like this before, but I always knew as a manager that, that attitude problems were, were the, the output. They were the result of a process of inputs, whether it was years or weeks, it was a series of factors that led up to this guy having a pretty stinky attitude, and he did. But I had to get beyond that as a manager. It was my responsibility to get beyond that. I can't just listen to you know what's written on the bathroom wall about you know th this this one individual and his attitude problem. I need to get in there and actually manage. I need to roll up the sleeves, figure out. So I talked to we'll call him Gary. And I called him in and I said, listen, I, I, I know you've been with the company 10 years. I've worked with you on a few projects before. I know you do excellent work. But this is what I'm hearing. And I wanted to hear your side of the story. And he'll tell a story. And, and then you get to the root cause in, in, you know, in your answer to the interviewer. And you basically advocate. Okay, you tell Gary, this is, this is the deal. This is what we can do to, to rectify the situation if it is indeed solvable. And you're like, this is what we can do to rebuild your credibility, do this, do that. Maybe, and it always falls into three buckets. Maybe it's, it's um, you know, well, the first bucket could be straight up bad apple attitude problem. But the second bucket is basically this guy does not know how to do the tasks he's been given. That's a very frustrating experience, and that results in an attitude problem. But let's retrain him. Or maybe the guy is way over allocated. Maybe Mr. Gary is way over allocated, and that's why we're seeing this attitude problem. So let's get him some more help. Maybe nobody knows, but somehow he's working for another boss as well in some other division in the company, and he's doing the work of a thousand men. 
well, let's get him some help. Let's see how we can cut up his tasks. Let's be smart about this team because really, the team wants everybody to succeed, right? So you go through and you literally um, get to the root cause of the issue. You figure out it's not in the attitude bucket. Uh, it's in the, in the I don't know how to do this bucket or the I'm over allocated bucket. You solve that problem and then you basically, um, you know, and of course you talk to Gary and you solve it. And of course you talk to the team and you solve it. And then you say, yeah, the quantitative results are we hit the milestone or we came from behind in the ninth inning to score all these runs and seal the deal on the project, but, which was what we were supposed to do. But qualitatively, this, the team had a greater understanding of how their own individual behaviors add up to the grand sum and yada, yada. So I would say that that is actually the, you know, that's actually the right answer um, for dealing with maybe a difficult person to talk to, but also an ethical dilemma. You know, maybe, maybe um, an ethical dilemma would be, you know, this guy Gary was really, really shafting the team and being a bad apple and, you know, putting salt in the, in the Kool-Aid or whatever. And you knew that you had, you know, you had, you had Gary on this or that. He showed up to work 10 times in a row But really before, you know, so the ethical dilemma is like, do I fire this guy? Like, by all accounts, he should be fired. Or do I actually try to work this problem out, even though I don't have a lot of time because I have other things to do, people to see? Well, you would like to work it out. Otherwise, you don't have a story. You like to work it out and... Things that so that can be literally be an ethical dilemma, um, but anyway, and you can see how similar these questions are. What other schools are you applying to? Okay, this is not a story. This is a straight up answer. I mean, there's this. I'll tell you this. I'll give you. I'll give you some some information. If you're applying to, let's say Columbia, and they ask you this question, and you say I'm also applying to Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, MIT. They know that they're the least pretty. You know, they're 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 not. Uh, you know, they're they're not on the front page. And you pretty much just told them that as soon as one of those other schools, and especially if you're a competitive applicant, as soon as one of those schools accepts me, I'm gone. See ya, bye. Uh, they're not. They're not. They're, you're not going to get in, especially if you're interviewing early, early decision at at Columbia. And they've they've had this happen before. People. People basically, you know, pull up stakes and leave and go to another school, even though they've committed to early decision. So um, you need to realize and you need to answer this question very carefully. That's all I really want to say about this. Uh, but um, it's, uh, trust me, this is a loaded question. They're going to ask you it in the interview. They're going to ask you it on the application form. This is always asked by schools who have a real chip on their shoulder about getting stood up um, or left at the altar. So just keep that in mind. Now, do you have any questions for me? That question is literally, do you have any questions for me? So this is um, where you have three to four, maybe five questions uh, ready to go. Uh, and and no, no gotcha questions. No, uh, well, you know, I've read reports at the Career Center, your school really, really sucks. Can you, um, can you explain that uh, to, uh, you know, the press corps, you never want to do that. No questions that are going to be on, on the defensive. Um, what I would say is, is all softball type questions, but questions that allow MBAs to talk about themselves. Let's face it, MBAs love talking about themselves. So, an MBA type people. So, just ask me, you know, why, you know, how is there, why did they choose to go to School X? How has their experience at School X has been, you know, I did, you know, if they tell you about career changing or whatever, and follow it up, you know, how difficult was that um, you know, when you, what was your message with recruiters? How did you sell it? So don't just, don't just punch the list. Like I said, don't just have your questions and I'm going to ask him hell or high water. Like roll with the punch a little bit, make it a conversation. How about that? So, um, let's see other questions. What would be other good questions? Uh, don't ask questions. Okay, here's what not to ask. Don't ask questions that you could find on the website. You know, so how many, uh, how many women are enrolled at the school? Like that's not a good question. Uh, talk about things that the interviewer cannot get wrong and talk about things that allow them to talk about themselves for the most part and not get wrong. Now, <clears throat> that being said, what questions do you have for me? Literally, it's been a long presentation. Hopefully, I still have most of you here with me and hopefully I've made it a little entertaining. But if you have any questions about any of the material that I've presented here today, I want you to email me. 
MBA at AmerasiaConsulting.com for those who, who can't read. No, but seriously, um, any material, anything you think I need to make more clear, any feedback on the presentation itself, uh, I would greatly appreciate. So that's all for today. And if you need to contact us about admissions consulting, to set up an initial consultation, or just to chat about what schools you should apply to, give us a call, email us, and I'd be more than happy to help you out.